Governors, first, thank you. Thank you for sharing your evening and, and on the front end for whatever comes out of the next 45 or 50 minutes. Um, you know, I had not worked with, as I mentioned before, known either of you, and, and we kind of came together 20 years ago when the tobacco companies, because of some states that had sued them for damages, reached agreements with our Attorney General for a perpetual payment for damages caused to the state because of tobacco. Governor Huckabee, you were in the, in the governor's office. Uh, Governor Beebe, you were in the Senate uh, leadership. Uh, Y'all came together for a session, but it didn't exactly work out as planned. Uh, share with us how a special session worked and how that one did not, and how we got to where we are now. Well, that one was pretty special. Um, <laughs> we thought it was gonna be pretty smooth sailing. It, it seemed that it was the rational and the right thing to do to take all of the money that was allocated toward Arkansas, and the money was given to Arkansas specifically because of health issues. So it made perfect sense that we would use the money exclusively for health, and that was the plan. The Senate had no problem getting that done. I'll give credit to uh, then-Senator Beebe for shepherding that through the Senate, but we got to the House, and it was a whole different story. And we had uh, some real challenges. Uh, my now good friend Bob Johnston was Speaker of the House, and for reasons that I'll never understand, and I love Bob to death, and we made our peace, but at the time, I'd like to have killed him, because he just uh, flat would not let that out of committee. We could not get it to the floor. Had we gotten it to the floor, it would have passed, but we couldn't get it out of committee, and he was holding it. And uh, finally, it just collapsed, and we ended up not being able to see that done. Of all people, Jay Bradford came up to me after the collapse of the session, and in his characteristic way, he said, Governor, take it to the people. Just take it to the people. Let them vote on it. Do an initiated act. he did act. this with his hand. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, that's a really good idea. And I can't believe Jay Bradford came up with it. <laughs> I hope Jay's here. Is he? <laughs> Doggone it. I wasted a good joke on him, and he's not even here. So 10 minutes later, I was on the Capitol steps announcing that we would do an initiated act. And that's exactly what we did. It was incredibly heavy lifting to do it in a short period of time. But I'll tell you, this is a classic example. It's like when uh, you know, Joseph was thrown in the well by his brothers. What was intended for harm turned out to be good. Because had it passed the legislature, 51% of any future legislature could have taken that money, pulled it back from health care, and divvied it up for their own special pet projects, which is frankly what the House wanted to do anyway. Because it went into an initiative act, then it would require a two-thirds majority, which is unlikely to ever happen. And Arkansas became the only state in America that designated and devoted 100% of its tobacco settlement monies to improve the health care of the citizens of its state. And I think it's one of the most important things that we saw happen. You may remember some different things about it. Oh, I remember it very well. Uh, you want me to tell that funny story about you? Uh, in the, it's a pretty good How story. How do I come I'm out of this? I, I was going to say. I'm going to tell, tell it. I'm going to tell it. You know, the, uh, there were three parts. The chart plan was devised by our healthcare community, uh, by UAMS, by the University of Arkansas, by a whole lot of folks with uh, involving uh, our healthcare uh, interests that really came up with a good plan. It had three parts to it generally. They were uh, cessation and prevention, uh, money actually for health care through ex some Medicaid, and then research. And uh, so uh, the, the chart plan was devised. It was worked. Governor uh, Huckabee endorsed it. He massaged it to, to his liking and threw the full force of the governor's office behind it. As he said, the Senate had no problem. We were on board. Uh, we were, uh, I think we, we passed it 29 to nothing. Uh, there was no dissenting votes. There were a few that were mad that didn't vote, but uh, they didn't vote no. Uh, but it got hung up in the House. <laughs> well, part of that program, and particularly the part on research, involved ASU, uh, which was important to me, the U of A. I never noticed that yeah, before. Yeah, I know. <laughs> U of A, which was important to me, because I hold a degree from there as well, UAMS, uh, Children's, and uh, the UA Department of Agriculture. And part of that program was, uh, 
was going to be devoted to research with regard to those entities and some, some activity with regard to those en entities. So as luck would have it, Governor Huckabee and I are, you know, we did this bipartisan gig from time to time where we flew around helicopters for passage of an amendment for, to save our schools and other things. And we were doing this uh, amendment at Frenchie Boudiette's uh, request in the old Supreme Court room. It was a, uh, Frenchie Boudiette was head of the Social Security Disability uh, Agency in Arkansas. And uh, uh, we were doing a PSA uh, to attack Social Security fraud. And when we got through, he said, you got a minute? I want to talk to you. And I said, sure, Governor. The governor asked for a minute. You give him a minute or whatever he wants. And so we went over to the bench and we sat down and uh, he was really mad at Bob Johnson. Uh, <laughs> and he was, we hadn't called a session yet, but it was, he was about to call it and we knew what was going on. And he unloaded on, to me about Bob Johnson, who was in the other house. And you know, he's got a great sense of humor, so uh, I poke him a little bit uh, from time to time. And usually he reacts uh, back the same way. And I said, now, Governor, that's not very Christian of you. <laughs> Mr. Theology here was telling me this. <laughs> and he said, that's political hardball. <laughs> this guy's mad. I'm not joking anymore. <laughs> So we talked a little more and he said, you know, we're not going to put the two universities' names in the bill. Don't worry about it. That's where, the, that's where it's going. We don't want to make UCA mad. We don't want to make UAPB mad. We don't want to make Arkansas Tech mad or SAU or Henry. So trust me, we're going to put their names in the bill. I said, no. I said, I'm trying to be polite. I said, Governor, you might die. <laughs> then where would we be? So we got to put their names in the bill. He said, no, we're not putting their names in the bill. This is a fight we don't need to have. I, I tried to reason with him. I said, you're going to build up expectations. No, no. And I said, well, Governor, if you don't put their names in the bill, it's not going through the Senate. He said, why do you want to be that way? <laughs> I said, that's political hardball. <laughs> we had a great, we, we had a good working relationship. He, uh, I know you, you've talked to us before about uh, him having to deal with a three-fourths Democratic uh, General Assembly. Uh, and uh, I had uh, Democratic General Assemblies until my last couple of years, and then I had a two-thirds Republican General Assembly. Uh, but you cross party lines uh, if you really are worth your salt at being elected. And where you have philosophical differences, you, you stick to your principles in those differences, but you work together for the people. and. And we had a good relationship for all that. He was a lieutenant governor, and the Senate has a different attitude about lieutenant governors because they're, they're, it's possessive. The lieutenant governors belong to the Senate. Governor Tucker's here. He was a lieutenant governor. He understands that uh, the senators have a, a fondness for lieutenant governors and a good working relationship. And uh, that probably helped you in the Senate. It didn't help you much in the House. <laughs> <laughs> Governors and, and Governor Tucker, uh, in his tenure, had to deal with health care by passing a soda tax to bail out our Medicaid program. As far as I can tell, looking at political campaigns, neither of y'all started as a health care governor. No. But, and I don't think Governor Hutchison did either, but he knew he was going to have to deal with it after what you left in the private option. Why does health care become such a central role for governors, and, and why do governors... How, how do they think about it as it's coming at them and it feels big, complex, costly? How does health care get on your radar screen and, and what do you think about it? Go ahead. Well, first of all, uh, governor of any state, doesn't matter if it's Arkansas, Texas, wherever, most people have never thought about this, but a governor operates the largest public health insurance program in his or her state, the Medicaid program. It is by far the largest publicly operated system. By nature of state employees, a governor also operates the largest private health care insurance program in any state. In fact, if you took all of the employees that were on the Arkansas health plan, there were more than there were with the combined employees of both Walmart and Tyson Foods. And this is true of most states. So you're operating, first of all, from an insurance perspective, the cost of premiums and health care for your employees and your Medicaid population. So you care deeply about what it's costing and the escalation of those costs when they're double digit every year mean that if you're going to manage your budget you're going to have to find a way uh, to make sure that the coverage is there 
but at the same time that it's affordable. You can't just cut the coverage. I mean, it's political suicide, but it's also a very ugly thing to do because those are people that you're going to bump into every day. And it's not just a political issue. It's a deeply personal issue. These are your friends, they're your families, they're the people that are your constituents and you care about them. So you have to look for ways to be innovative and creative. And Our Kids First was really birthed out of the necessity of what do you do for those kids whose parents make too much money to be on Medicaid, but they don't make enough money to be able to afford the ever-increasing cost of a private uh, policy health insurance premium. And I still to this day believe that that was a notable program, but I also believe that it became the template for what should be a much larger view of how the government partners with the private sector uh, to make health care accessible and affordable by creating buy-in on the part of the recipient. Um, that was the key to making our kids first work. Uh, Mike Beebe was the chief Senate sponsor of our kids first. I think in the nearly 11 years I was in office, it was the only thing I ever saw passed unanimously in both the House and the Senate, yeah. um, to my remembrance, yeah. it was. I, I think it was 97 to nothing in the House, and it was like uh, 32 or 33 to nothing in the Senate. It, it was, there may have been a couple of just present votes, but nobody voted against it. And I don't think that ever happened again. And that was in my first month in office when we passed that. Um, I, I'm just convinced that it was the result of everybody looking at this and recognizing this was not, as I often say, some issues are horizontal. By that I mean they're left, right, liberal, conservative, Democrat, Republican. When you can take an issue that is traditionally horizontal and you can make it a vertical issue, and it no longer is left and right, but it becomes up or down, better or worse. How are we going to make life better for the people in our state? Vertical issues can pass in a bipartisan way. Horizontal issues often cannot. Our Kids First became a true vertical issue, and it was hard for someone to argue that the people who were working, working hard, that their kids shouldn't have some access to affordable health care, that if they just would quit their jobs and not work, they could have had a platinum level uh, Medicaid program. Yeah, it was a, it's a great example. Uh, and Amy Rossi and Arkansas advocates that, yeah. uh, that put, had pushed for so long, and then, and then when you uh, embraced it, uh, it, it resulted in that kind of, uh, I've never thought of the term horizontal versus vertical, but uh, it was not a left or right issue, yeah. and, it, and it became unanimous. To answer your question about how do governors end up with health care, in addition to what he said, sometimes things are thrust on you. Uh, without regard to uh, any plan, and certainly with the private option, uh, you had a situation where you had the Affordable Care Act passed and then the Supreme Court ruling that resulted in uh, the Medicaid expansion piece of the Affordable Care Act being optional. And all of the political rhetoric and, uh, you know, the division in the country uh, that surrounded it uh, created uh, an issue on your doorstep, on my doorstep, uh, with all the attendant uh, posturing and political uh, ramifications involved in it. Uh, and so sometimes you don't plan, you know, I, I thought I was going to be the education economic development governor. I, the, uh, all governors are education economic development, but the cornerstones of, you know, what I ran on and what I believed uh, were so important that if you could get those two things right, the other things would be more easily solved, whether it's criminal justice or social justice or health care, whatever the case might be. But then you're confronted with facts that you didn't anticipate, uh, and you have to be able to adjust and adapt to them. Governors have to do that. Uh, we're kind of partial now to the executive branch uh, compared to what's going on in Congress. Uh, but if those folks ever had to solve a problem, like governors have to solve them, uh, that are thrust on you, uh, we'd be a whole lot better better off in this country. So uh, uh, sometimes you don't ask for it, it just presents itself to you. So let me go with the private option. I can remember Andy Allison, Craig Wilson, myself, <laughs> being in your second floor office, was your second floor office. He changed the drapes, I think. No, I, I made it look a lot better. He had it all. <laughs> <laughs> and you and your chief of staff, Moral Harriman, couldn't believe what we were suggesting. Yeah. I thought you were nuts. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I told, uh, he was your Surgeon General, 
And then I inherited him as my surgeon general. Uh, I don't know why I kept him. <laughs> because he was good at what he did. Oh, uh, okay. That's why. But I told him earlier today, uh, this evening, I said, you know, you think all this stuff up and then you expect me to do it. Uh, it, it was unique in so many ways. A lot of, in some ways, people don't even know about or talk about. First of all, politically, in the climate we were in nationally, taking the Medicaid money and using it for insurance to provide the exact same coverages that would have been provided had it been traditional Medicaid, created a political hook for some people that made it more palatable. Secondly, it had the salutary effect of increasing competition in our state because we had several other health insurance carriers because of the new population and the new opportunities. I know Blue Cross probably didn't want the competition, but you know, uh, we ended up with more competition, which ultimately helped everybody, including Blue, Blue Cross, and, uh, who's a major sponsor of ACI. I'm talking good about it. <laughs> we'll take Centene, we'll what, take Qual Choice. <laughs> what people did not realize, and, and we weren't lying to them, we just didn't have to broadcast it, is that we already had on the books a premium, health insurance premium tax. So we didn't have to raise any more taxes. We didn't have to ask them to vote on any more taxes. But because we're using this money for insurance, we create a pool of tax money that can help defray, that, and we rat hole that money. We didn't spend it on anything else. We put it in a fund so that when we had to start uh, paying 5%, 7%, up to ultimately 10% by 2020 of the total cost of the, of the program, that we would have a revenue stream to take care of it, and we'd have a pot of money. That, and it depended on who you were talking to in the legislature as to what argument you used. You can use that argument. Uh, don't worry about that 10% or that 5%. We've got a plan to help defray it. You don't even have to vote for any anymore. Don't worry about it being just a, another bureaucratic program. We're going to do it with, a, with insurance. Uh, and then there are other arguments uh, over and above the chief argument that you're going to provide a quarter of a million Arkansans with health care that never had it before, the overwhelming majority of whom were already working but they were working in C stores and restaurants and places that didn't carry uh, health insurance. And they couldn't, as you said with, with our kids, didn't have the wherewithal to be able to afford uh, health care. What's it going to do to hospitals? As I recall, in 13, when we passed it the first time, and you have to do this every year because it's appropriation, uh, it was something like si close to $60 million a year just for UAMS. Uh, I asked, uh, Ray Montgomery's here, I asked what it was for Cersei, and I think it was 5 or $6 million a year that we would not have. So when you talk about closing rural hospitals, when you talk about reducing staff even on big hospitals and services even on big hospitals, it was a real big argument. And you always had the good political argument, and Mike and I were talking about this earlier, you want to give your money to, you want our tax money to go to California to pay for their expanded health care and us tell our citizens we're not going to get it. So it depended on who you, you had a lot of great arguments. And it depended on who you, you talked to uh, uh, as to which argument you made. You, that's all compounded by an antiquated constitution that requires a three-fourths vote of both houses to pass an appropriation bill, which is what this required. Uh, so how do you, you can't get three-fourths vote in the House and the Senate for motherhood and apple pie, much less Obamacare in, in a, in a, with all due respect with my Republican friends dominating the legislature, uh, well, you had a wacky idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Governor Huckabee, you talk about horizontal and vertical. Seems like clean indoor air should be a vertical issue, but it was pretty horizontal, as I recall. <laughs> it was very horizontal. Uh, <laughs> Honestly, it was one of the things of all the health care initiatives, it was one of the things I was personally most proud of us getting done because it was an incredible challenge to get people to believe that it was the right thing to do to essentially ban smoking in any uh, public place where people came. It was restaurants, it was office buildings, and of course there were so many people that wanted many carve-outs. And, and I remember we had a real battle with an industry that was uh, some of my best friends, the people in the hospitality business. 
And many of them were really pushing back hard because they said it's going to hurt their business. And they were afraid that if they had a, a no smoking restaurant, that people would quit coming. And I always thought, people don't go to a restaurant to smoke, they go to eat. And the, the most rewarding thing, by the way, I'll tell you one little funny story. Mike may remember this, but we were having a hard time in the house and Bob Mathis of Hot Springs was really pushing hard against us. By the way, the reason we can name names and all this stuff is because neither of us are ever going to run for anything again. We don't give a darn. It's just that simple. We can have a reckless abandon to what really happened. So Bob was totally against the Indoor Air Act, and he was fighting us tooth and nail, and he was being fairly effective in getting a lot of representatives to be against it in the House. And for some reason that I will never fully understand, Bob wanted to add an amendment to the bill that he would vote for it if we would make it so that uh, a mother could not smoke in a car if her children were in the car with her. If there was a car seat in the car, you could not smoke in the car. And we thought he was sucker punching us. We honestly did. We thought, yeah, he's doing that because it's going to be such an extreme bill that you're going to tell a mother what she can or can't do in her own car that that will forever kill the bill. Well, much to our shock, adding that amendment, he said, okay, now I'm for it. And we thought, okay, he's doing that because he knows that we're going to lose 20 House votes. We picked up votes, <coughs> and I sent the word down, get the Speaker to call the roll, let's get this thing voted on before they change their mind. And that's how the Clean Air Act came about. To this day, I don't know whether that was a sincere move on Bob's part or not. I'm going to assume that it is. But let me give you a postscript, and this to me is a beautiful uh, result of when you do the right thing, it does come back to, to serve good purposes. Months after the Clean Air Act passed, I had people from the Hospitality Association come and say, you know, we were really afraid that was going to kill business. But we found two things have resulted from the Clean Air Act. Number one, our cleaning bills have gone down dramatically because we don't have to scrub nicotine off the floors, the tables, and the walls. And our cleaning efforts and costs are really dramatically different. And the second thing is when people come and they eat and they don't smoke, they get up and they leave, and we're turning tables over 25% faster, <laughs> and we're making more money because we don't have people waiting for the people at the table to quit their cigarettes. They eat, they get up, and they get the heck out of the restaurant, and another family comes and sits down and eats. So they were actually making more money. It took a while to get those thank yous, but it was very much <laughs> worth it. And I, I was thrilled that that finally got to happen. Governor, what are you most proud of that you did in the health space or health care space? Probably keeping team? you on as Surgeon General. Isn't it? <laughs> now what so you want to so up? <laughs> now wait, wait, no, wait. I, I, I've got a story now. Because I was his Surgeon General. I know. And I, I kept you. For and six, the other guy yep. fired you. Yep. For six. <laughs> <laughs> replaced. <laughs> but for six months, your first six months of office. Yeah. We didn't talk. Okay. <laughs> you know why? No. Because he was running for president. Oh, you were with him? No. The no. Democratic Party nationally was trying to undo everything he was doing. Oh. Oh. So you hung around? Well, you were paying me. Oh, no. <laughs> I can remember he quit in July, J June, sometime early June. And I went over to talk to Morrill. And I said, Morrill, it's June the 29th. My contract's up tomorrow, and the, somebody in the press is going to be smart and call and say, are you going to stay on as Surgeon General? I said, I don't care what the answer is. Let's just make it be the same. <laughs> if you weren't fired, that meant you stayed on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the, uh, the thing that, uh, uh, there are a lot of things I was proud of, but I assume you're talking about health care. If we could stay on topic, that yeah, would be good. Okay. The one, the one area that doesn't get a lot of attention that I think will have more far-reaching ramifications than all the other good things we've talked about, the trauma system, the private option, uh, the our kids first, uh, the, the payment reform, in my opinion, is the most critical, not just for the cost issues that uh, plague health care, but the quality issues, uh, the ability to maximize uh, telemedicine, e-medicine, 
Uh, and uh, I came away from a conference in Boston in, I think, 08 or 09, absolutely convinced that fee for service as the basis for our health care system was unsustainable. Uh, it's evidenced by what you've seen with regard to the cost of health care uh, going through the roof. And uh, there are a lot of factors involved, but fee for service is a component that I thought was totally unsustainable. With your help and your guidance and your leadership and you and Andy, uh, y'all, I guess y'all fought off stage, uh, but when you came to me, uh, you, you, you came usually with the United Front. I wanted to get rid of fee for service to the extent we could. You have to do it incrementally. You can't just turn over everything uh, all at once. And you all devised the episodes that we were going to be able to utilize. Uh, it wasn't like the old DRGs, but there's, there's some kinship in there somewhere. But uh, it actually provided improved quality in addition to uh, con containing and controlling costs. So where our costs were going up 2%, we looked down the road in Louisiana's was what, 18 in Texas was 28% a year, and we were going up too. Our medical community folks want to be able to provide quality care. They want to be able to do it in ways that, uh, that are meaningful in terms of the ability of people to be able to access it and certainly to pay for it. Uh, they don't need to be concerned uh, with all the red tape and all the other stuff that, uh, that you have to be concerned with that goes along with it. And so devising a system, incrementally bringing along, and you doctors were the hardest bunch. Hospitals got it fairly early, but you doctors were a pain in the butt for a while. Huh? <laughs> but, then, but then the physicians started getting into it. And it's like good public policy. Good public policy is made when you get the people on the front line that have to implement it involved in helping to design and create the public policy. So we got the doctors, we got the insurance companies, we got the business leaders and business communities, we got the nurses, we got the hospital people, we got all of the components uh, directly affected and touched. And we haggled and we hashed and we argued and we went slow and incrementally. And uh, a small anecdote, anecdotal example, I guess, it's not actually the anecdote, that illustrates in lay terms what people can understand now is you got an MRI in El Dorado 10 o'clock this morning and they figure they can't fix you they're sending you to UAMS and that MRI beats you to UAMS before your ambulance gets up here under the old system not saying any of you people would do it but under the old system, there's incentive to do another MRI when you get to UAMS. Now, there may be justification for doing another one. And there's provisions for that. But absent something that you can actually justify, why should you pay for a second MRI three hours after you took the previous MRI if there's not anything wrong with the previous MRI? You multiply that many-fold. Uh, and that payment reform system, which now as silly as this federal government can be, it's now been adopted by Medicare, right? Medicare is now following Arkansas. Arkansas was first. Federal government's trying to get along. I don't know if any other states are doing it. But that's res a result of leadership from you people, from ACI, and from your work, too, and your, yours. And, and collaborators and across the and state. A lot that of took the whole health care system. It took it all. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's what I'm probably as, as proud of in the health care field. As, uh, don't get me wrong. I love the private option. I love the trauma system. I'm glad to have been of, uh, to have been of help in your uh, efforts with regard to uh, our kids first. But uh, long term, that's probably going to have a greater impact. Governor, your legacy issue you would like to... Well, I think our kids was probably uh, innovative, and I give Amy Rossi a lot of credit because we were sitting in a meeting, <laughs> and uh, it was when everybody was trying to figure out how to cut the budget. I mean, that was the whole discussion. We had all the providers, everybody there, and I, I was almost glazed over just from everybody telling me how much more money they needed and why they needed it worse than everyone else at the table. And it was Amy's turn, and she came, and instead of asking for more money for her organization, she said, let's do something for the kids. And the way she said it and the manner in which she made the appeal made me realize, here's a person who's not advocating for her organization. 
She's truly advocating for people who have no voice except hers in this room. And it was a powerful, revealing moment for me. And I remember sitting down with Ray Hanley and others and saying, how do we do this? And that's where, over a period of a few weeks, we came up with a plan that would work. And one of the most notable moments, and it was spontaneous, a lot of people think it was uh, maybe contrived, but it wasn't. When it came time to sign the bill, we decided that we would have a group of children sitting around the table. I'd signed the legislation with, with these kids sitting around. They were given some colors so that they could color pictures to keep them occupied so they didn't get bored. And when it came time to sign the bill, I thought, there's nothing in the law that says I can't sign a bill with a crayon. So I reached <laughs> over and picked up a crayon and signed the legislation with a crayon. Probably the best crayon work I've ever done in my life. And uh, that became kind of the symbol of Our Kids First. But here's what it meant. I, it was several months later, I was doing a reception over in Hot Springs at a hotel. And when all the people had left and it was time to go into the main event, the lady working for the caterer stayed and, and just stayed back. And when everyone had left, she came over to me and she started crying. And she said, thank you because of our kids first, my daughter, who's 14, got heart surgery at Children's Hospital and she's going to live. I'm telling you, I nearly lost it. I'm thinking, good gosh. We knew it was going to be important, but to hear a mother speak about her 14-year-old daughter having life because the surgery saved her life that the mother could never have afforded on a waitress's salary. And she was able to say, I was able to take my daughter to the best children's hospital in the state, and she's alive today. Pretty good. That's good. Let me ask, I have been with both of you to Washington to meet with the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Uh, Governor Huckabee, with you originally, it was with Tommy Thompson, and then we went through a couple, and we ended up with, with uh, uh, Governor Levitt as mm -hmm. the Human Services Secretary when we were pushing for and ultimately got an 1115 waiver to help small businesses, AR Health Networks. <coughs> Governor Beebe, with you and, and, and Secretary Sebelius, these are rare from my perspective, they're rare events. Y'all may meet with secretaries all the time as a governor. I'm sure you do across all the agencies. But these are pretty big deals where you're coming with a, a, a purpose and they've got a set of responsibilities and staff are interacting with each other. And ultimately, it comes down to the personal interactions between you and the secretary about what happens. Would y'all share with the audience kind of your experience with that and also if you have you know, we may have a future governor out here. If, if, they, need, if they need the keys to the kingdom, uh, how do you negotiate with the federal government? Well, first of all, let me say, if you are a future governor, it's the best job in the world. And it I is. Think Mike would agree. It is. In all of politics, there's no job that is more fulfilling, uh, more rewarding, because you can actually have an idea and get it done. I watch people in Congress. I see what's happening in D.C., and I would... Uh, the, thing I thank God for often is that I did not get elected to the U.S. Senate. Um, I Dale Bumpers was grateful for that. Too. What's that? Dale Bumpers was grateful for that. <laughs> I think all of America is grateful for that. Um, dealing with a secretary is really dealing with not just the secretary, but the administration of the president. I, I want to share something in candor with you. Bill Clinton was president when I first became governor. And so the first few years that I was uh, in office, I was dealing with the Clinton administration. And to his credit, Bill Clinton made sure that if Arkansas needed something, he pushed hard to get then Donna Shalala to help give it to us. And I did not have, I, I would love to say that it was as easy dealing with the Bush administration, which it should have been for me, but it actually was not. It was more difficult dealing with the Bush administration, not the secretaries, because I had a great personal relationship with Tommy Thompson and Mike Levitt. These were dear personal friends of mine. They were willing to deal with us, but every time we would hit either a political or some legal uh, snag. And this is a great example of don't always believe that uh, the, the partisan nature of politics is as predictable as you would expect it to be. Because if I called the White House when Bill Clinton was in office, I didn't get a third tier government affairs person. The president called me back usually within half an hour. 
And it was personal. What can I do? How can I help? And I said, I, we need to waiver at DHS and uh, our HHS. And almost inevitably, he would call, get the appointment. And it makes a big difference when the president tells the secretary, <laughs> see my governor and I want something done. In all candor with the Bush administration, it was often that some 20-year-old had been sent to the agency to make decisions and to sort of safeguard the political kingdom. And Joe, I mean, you saw that firsthand. It was very difficult for us to get things done. Even when the secretaries wanted to do it, there were so many people within their agencies that would mess it up. Um, so I, I just look back with a real sense that it's going to the right people with the right ideas and hopefully convincing them and you really want to have an atmosphere in which politics does not govern whether or not you get the help. It has nothing to do with whether your politics are the same as the person you're asking. If it's a good idea, let's do it. And if it's a bad idea, then tell us why it's a bad idea. But give us the opportunity to try it. And one thing I always believe that we should have done more of as a country is let states try things. Rather than the federal government coming up with a 50-state template that was a failure, and all 50 states are adversely affected, turn the governors loose. Governors are innovators by necessity. And if it works in a two or three states, then other states will duplicate it. And if it doesn't, you don't have a 50-state mistake. And it's something I've never understood why the federal government uh, does not recognize the value of road testing some ideas, whether it's a private option or whether it's our kids or whatever it is. It would make a huge difference in effective policy. Yeah, I, I, every governor's conference, and I, I would argue virtually every governor I ever met, uh, constantly thinks that there needs to be more flexibility, and that's yeah. the word that, that governors use, uh, from federal government mandates regulations so that the states, which are called the laboratories of democracy and innovation, uh, can try different things. Sometimes states are successful in getting in the administration or the Congress to, to accede to that. Sometimes they're not. Uh, in my case, uh, I, had, I had the good fortune of having uh, Kathleen Sebelius as, uh, <laughs> I just thought of a great story that got nothing to do with this, but you ought to hear it. Uh, <laughs> but I had Kathleen Sebelius who had been the governor of uh, Kansas. And, uh, so you had Obama who was looking for a win in the South, looking for a win anywhere uh, with uh, Medicaid expansion. And so I had some things going for us. Plus, it was a good idea. Uh, it was well thought out. And uh, it, it, we were going to abide by all the same regulations as, as though it was going to be straight Medicaid in terms of the coverage and, and uh, uh, how it was going to be uh, implemented. Uh, but those personal relationships help. I agree with uh, Governor Huckabee that uh, good ideas ought to be good ideas regardless of uh, the partisan nature of, of where, they, where they come from. I, I didn't have the luxury of had, having Bill Clinton. Uh, I, had, uh, I had W my first couple years, and then I had Obama my last uh, six. But my go-to person when I needed something, I call Joe Biden. Uh, for whatever reason, that was the connection that, uh, that I felt uh, the strongest with. And I had the same kind of relationship and results with Joe Biden that you do with Bill Clinton. He'd call back 30 minutes or an hour and, and, and do virtually anything he could to help. But while we're on that subject of one totally off the topic uh, humorous story about secretaries, uh, you remember the ice storm in uh, 09 that devastated the north part of the state? I mean, and you. Governors end up in a whole lot of disaster uh, locations. And so uh, it was like 72 hours before I got to Mountain Home. I'd been everywhere. I'd been to Fayetteville. I'd been to Corning. I'd been, but you know, you can't get to, uh, in a helicopter, you can't get to every place the next day. And uh, you remember uh, Joe Bodenheimer, the county mm -hmm. judge, red headed, yeah. uh, red headed county, county judge in Baxter County, Mountain Home. Friend of mine, supporter, good guy hot-tempered, uh, taking care of his people. Uh, and that helicopter landed at the airport at Baxter County, and uh, here comes Joe and all his people, and 
he's mad. I hadn't seen enough National Guard. I hadn't seen, had not any out of, uh, out of county troopers that had been up here to help us up. About that time, my cell phone rang. And it was our former colleague uh, from Arizona, uh, the governor of Arizona. Napolitano. Janet Napolitano, who had just been appointed Secretary of Homeland Security, under which, over which uh, she administered FEMA. Talking about disaster assistance. And he's chewing on me, and, and uh, Janet says, uh, Mike, I uh, heard about how bad it is. You let me know what we can do to help. Uh, we're here ready. I said, Madam Secretary, can you, can you talk to a friend of mine? <laughs> Every time I was in a county judge's meeting after that, I'd tell that story about Joe, and that, his face would get even redder than it always was. Great. Well, we've got a few minutes left. If you have a question, please pass it in and uh, let us get going. I do want to go one place, governors, with y'all, and, and I think this is it's in the room, and we need to put out, you know, our state is now doing another one of those flexibility experiments under the 1115 waiver with the work uh, community engagement work requirement. Sure. Um, we've got another dozen states that have asked or are in the process of asking to do the same thing. Um, a few of those states are even asking to do it on the traditional Medicaid program, mm -hmm. not just the expansion. Just curious, your thoughts of, of work requirements and the expectations uh, of lower income folks on, on what they should be expected to, to, to do in exchange for social support? Well, uh, there are two, three things to mention here with regard to the work requirement on the private option, or as it's now called Arkansas Works. Uh, the overwhelming majority of the people on the private option are already working. Uh, they were the working poor. Uh, there were several exceptions for those who can't work for children at home or that they have to take care of. Uh, but a real smart columnist friend of mine uh, is often quoted is saying, uh, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And uh, while I might have tried to do it a different way, Governor Hutchinson was faced with a, uh, a pragmatic situation that he needed to continue the program. And I applaud him for continuing the program. I've, I've told him privately, and I'm here to tell you publicly, uh, Governor Hutchinson's continuation of the private option under any other name is something we all ought to be uh, very grateful for and very proud of. <laughs> I think you have to be very careful and make sure that you don't inadvertently drop worthy people out of a system when they need it. Uh, but I will, I will acknowledge sometimes the pragmatic nature of getting 90% of a loaf is, is worth doing. Now let's go back and make sure that, that we're fair to the other 10%. Good. Well, I would just add that I think work requirements are legitimate. You just have to make sure that it's uh, an honest uh, uh, assessment of real work and that if people are able-bodied and they can work and there's a job to be had and this kind of uh, time when the unemployment level is unbelievably low, uh, then that's, that's to me a fair uh, request. We did it with TANF. Mm -hmm. uh, there were people who said that we were going to destroy people. It would just be the worst thing that could ever happen. We did a two-year lifetime uh, limitation back in 1997 when we did the welfare reform. We took 50 percent, moved them off of welfare onto work. It was another bipartisan effort. There was a lot of fights about the work and education requirement. But when the, the dust was settled, people went to work. And, and what we found was that there were people who couldn't work. And they weren't punished for that. They, there was no penalty. And there was an, uh, really an accommodation made for people who, either because of uh, mental or physical limitations, were simply not capable of being in the workforce. Or people who legitimately had family issues or had mm -hmm. developmentally disabled children at home, and, and that just wasn't a reality for them. So there were exceptions and accommodations which needed to be made. But by the same token, there were people that could work, and they just frankly didn't, because why would they? It, it, why would you go and spend several hours a day working at a job if you could get the same or more money by not doing it. I mean, at that point, who's stupid? The government or the people who are taking advantage of a program that they can take advantage of? 
so work requirements are a good thing, and I think it builds confidence in the pr government programs. I'll tell you a great old story that we found out in doing TANF, and it probably goes to the same with any type of work requirement. We found that there was one thing that people needed that they had never owned before that was necessary for them to be able to go from welfare to work, and you'll never believe what that instrument was. An alarm clock. <laughs> This is a true story. We, we would talk to the clients, and they would be told, now, you need to show up at this job at 8 o'clock in the morning. And they said, well, how will I know how to get up? And we'd just simply say, and our workers at the DHS offices would say, well, you, you set your alarm clock. And they said, what's an alarm clock? I don't have one of those. And they had, I know you think I'm making this up, but you can go to the offices in 75 counties and talk to the frontline workers who were there at the time, and they will tell you that the thing they had to make sure that people had was an alarm clock because they'd never had one. They never had to wake up at a specific time to be at a job at a specific hour. And that was a key to the success of welfare to work back in 1997-98. For our audience, TANF is the Transitional Assistance Program for Needy Families. And President Clinton and the Republican Congress ended up modifying the, the form and function yep. of, that, of that benefit. We've got a question, a good question that we haven't touched on yet from, from Jim. How do consumers become more engaged and held responsible for how they use health care? <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> how do consumers become more engaged and held responsible for how they use health care? Well, the patient-centered medical home that you have championed so long uh, is a holistic approach that tries to get to that very issue uh, so that uh, the physician ends up being or the nurse or the nurse practitioner ends up being part parent uh, to the patient about are you taking your meds are you uh, not smoking are you not drinking as much or whatever the whatever the issue is and it almost puts our healthcare professionals in the posture or in the position of being a semi-parent uh, to a recalcitrant patient who acts like a child sometimes. But uh, nobody is in our society is in a better position to try to influence that patient's behavior uh, than that healthcare professional that that patient actually uh, uh, trusts mm -hmm. and, and depends on. Uh, gosh, uh, if it can't be done there, then you just have to uh, get them placebos or something and uh, send them home. <laughs> Thoughts? I mean, I think we, we did do some things that did work uh, with state employees. For example, giving them cash rewards for doing a health risk assessment. And if they did an HRA, <coughs> they would get $500 for the employee, $1,000 if uh, both spouse and employee were participating. Uh, we paid 100% of the cost of smoking cessation programs. We paid for uh, coach uh, health coaches, and we found that that was helpful. If a person really wanted to improve their health, uh, it was beneficial to provide health coaching, whether it was by telephone or in person. And if you add to that financial incentives, either a discount on their health insurance or cash rewards for their participation in various uh, health outcome assessments, uh, there is a greater level of participation. I mean, look, let's face it, nobody says, I'd really like to be the sickest person in my family. I mean, nobody says that. Nobody says, I want to feel way more awful than I already feel. Nobody says that. And so if you can help people to want to uh, take better charge of their health, and you add to that an incentive, there's some power in that, as I think we saw. You know, from, from Debbie, you know, Arkansas and other states are having I guess, problems with increasing health insurance costs. She's moved to a high deductible plan, yeah. as many of her friends. Um, is that a good idea? <laughs> no, the higher deductible, sometimes people have to go to it because uh, that's all the premium they can afford. Uh, the cost of health care in this country has to be addressed nationally, but the states have a role and can do things, albeit uh, on a 
incremental basis like we did with payment reform. It has really worked in Arkansas. It has stopped the, it hasn't lowered costs, but it's stopped the, the uh, upward uh, spiral, uh, at least the slope of the upward spiral, and, and completely uh, uh, separated us from sister states around us in terms of what our health care costs are. But prescription drugs are such a big part of the problem, too, that that's going to have to be addressed. There's no reason why Canadians can't, uh, are paying so much less for the same drug that uh, Americans are paying for. Uh, that obviously will have to be addressed on, on the national level. But some people can't afford to have their insurance unless they take the, the larger deductibles. And we're seeing those $5,000 and $8,000 a year deductibles, which frankly could bankrupt a family uh, with a catastrophic uh, illness. Yeah, I, we used to say that uh, most Arkansas families are one root canal away from basically being insolvent. And that's really true. A lot of people didn't understand that that was a true assessment of the financial capability of a lot of families. There's a way I believe we could get there. Part of it is the combination of a health savings account, which creates an incentive for the individual uh, to save money and not unnecessarily spend health care dollars unless they need to. You have a higher deductible plan, but here's the key. And this is where health savings accounts have not operated properly. If a person has a high deductible, but they have a health savings account, that could work under one condition, that the employer would provide the first thousand dollars, fifteen, or even twenty-five hundred dollars uh, to pay for what what is that uh, foundation of the health savings account? Because if that's first dollar out of the employee's pocket, and they don't have that uh, that initial money, then they can't even enter into that program. So that's where I believe there's got to be a better partnership between, uh, for example, in the case of the government, what the government is willing to to pay because they, then they are incentivizing the, uh, the client um, in a way that would really work. Uh, I, I feel the same way about people who have pre, uh, pre-existing conditions. It's been a big political football. Truth is there's people that have incredible health care costs, no fault of their own. They shouldn't be punished, and the family shouldn't be made to be bankrupt before they get any type of assistance. But if you put them in the general private health care pool, they skew the cost so that people who are in a plan are going to pay way more than they should be paying who don't have those huge costs. How do you fix that? I think that's where the government puts aside a huge amount of money that is on reserve to help the families of those with extraordinary health care costs. Families with uh, children who have developmental disabilities, people with uh, very significant and exotic health care costs because of pre-existing conditions. And you take them out of the pool that would normally be in a health care plan because they can't do anything but skew the cost. Then you might be able to manage so that the insurance program is manageable. And I think a lot of people don't understand that insurance is a highly regulated industry. Insurance companies don't just get to jack up the price because they'd like to. They've got to go to the insurance commission and beg for the opportunity to raise the rates. They have to prove that they need it. And I, I just think a lot of people don't understand the nature of the business, but if a health insurance company, or for that matter, any insurance company, has to pay out more than they make, they go out of business and nobody gets insurance. And a lot of it is fundamentals of teaching people simple economics and basically what an insurance company can and cannot do to be able to function. Under Governor Hutchinson's leadership and the General Assembly's push, we now have a transparency initiative that is going to start to publish prices on what it costs. I think there's an education sure. literacy part there, sure. too, that we need Absolutely. to work on. We're coming to the close of our time. Let me give the two of you a chance to have any final comments that you would like to. And, and You go right ahead, 44. Uh, 44. <laughs> well, I know I look 44, so I guess that's why you wanted me to go ahead and go. Um, I want to say, first of all, thanks to Joe Thompson and ACI for the extraordinary work they've done. Governors are not experts in health care policy. I, I, I look at it this way. We're not the chemist, we're the pharmacist. We don't develop the medicine, but we dispense it. Our job is not necessarily to always have the greatest ideas because we may not be health care professionals. But when the good ideas are brought to us by people like the folks at ACI or UAMS, then it is our job to make sure that we dispense it in the most effective way possible. And that's really what I see the, the, 
the partnership between the political side and the policy side. And when it works, it's a beautiful thing. And it often worked in Arkansas. And I'm going to say thanks to Joe, to all the folks at ACI, and thanks to all of you who came out here to hear a bunch of has-beens uh, reminisce about the horror stories of being governor of Arkansas, which was the greatest job in the whole world. Well, I'd echo uh, what uh, Governor Huckabee had just mentioned. Uh, thank all of you. Uh, I uh, mentioned it earlier that uh, we don't make public policy without actually involving the people that have to implement that policy on the front end, being in the room and being in the discussion. It's kind of what he's talking about. Uh, that's how it works. And that's how government should work. That's how a governor should work. You won't always agree. Uh, you don't agree among yourselves. Uh, so you can't expect a governor to agree with you all the time, but at least you take the input. And ACI and our healthcare community has been a wonderful partner in that regard. I'd be remiss, however, if I didn't mention, especially since uh, Dr. Westbrook had been up here before, uh, that we're on the verge, we're on the edge of uh, maybe getting there uh, with the National Cancer Institute designation at UAMS. And all of us, uh, that, that disease that encompasses so many different diseases, that term that encompasses so many different diseases, uh, is so prevalent in all of our lives uh, with our families, ourselves, or our friends, or our colleagues, uh, that if, if we, the next step we need to do collectively as a group is to do what we can to make sure that that designation gets there. Uh, we've come real, real close. Uh, and since you're always good at stirring up new stuff, you ought to start on that. <laughs> thank you all for your attention and for Governors, your thank you for being here. Let me ask you to join them, me, in a round of applause. This concludes our evening's events. Uh, on behalf of our policy board and our center, uh, and our sponsoring organizations, let me commit to you to make our third decade in existence, solve some of these unresolved issues, and tackle the new ones that come at us. As I mentioned at the opening, we really don't get anything done without collaboration and partnership and working together across the state. Uh, and we look forward to continuing that with you and expanding that with others. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. Good to be it with you. Fun. It was fun. It was, it was good. You, you tell Janet much. how. I will. Get my thank message you. in. Thank you. Great job. Thank great. you very much. That was great. Enjoyed being here. It was fun. It was a